So Hare Krishna everyone. Those who are first time, those who are regulars, those in between, Hare Krishna. <coughs> so I'm going to chant a few other mantras to invoke auspiciousness. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Makyana Timirandasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshuran Militam Yenadas Mai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Yenabutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swabrantikam Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sari Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Vagisha Yasya Vadane, Lakshmir Yasya Chavakshasi, Yasya Steridaye Samvit, Tamrasim Ham Maham Baje, Pralada Ridayaladam Bhakta Vitiviram, Sharatin Durjim Vande Parindra Vandanam Harim. So when you are getting in touch with the Hare Krishnas, then you hear a lot about transcendental sound. We always speak about transcendental sound, transcendental knowledge, um, entering into transcendence. So this word is used a lot and has quite a um, significant role in our philosophy. Everything centers around transcendental sound actually. So we, what we were just doing while singing Kirtan, um, we actually were supposed to, uh, how to say, manifest transcendental sound. So the word transcendental literally means that which is beyond. We enter a, a level or a sphere beyond Usually it's related to what is perceivable to the senses. Transcendence is that what is beyond that. So we have kind of two spheres at least that we are talking about. So the so-called material sphere and then the spiritual sphere. And they of course they somehow overlap at times but then we see them also separate. Um, and if you talk of something being transcendental or we transcending something, that means we move from what is called material energy to what is called spiritual energy. So another term that is very much connected with transcendental means spiritual. So it's a different type of nature. And our philosophy claims that the names that we are singing, Krishna, Hare and Rama, are transcendental sound vibrations that they are not material sound, as we would say. This poses um, somewhat of a challenge, because we could argue, well, if transcendental sound is by definition beyond the perception of the senses, what is it that I hear there? Can I even hear transcendental sound? You know, if I have material eyes, you know, in my vocal cords, you know, with, with whom I uh, with which I produce that sound, can that be spiritual? Right? And we have statements um, that very much emphasize, you know, this name, these names are not different from Krishna, therefore we can associate with Krishna through the chanting. We can connect uh, the meaning of yoga by calling these names. A Maha Mantra is also a lot about invocation. The name Hare, for example, is the, the invocative form is Hara. And that invoking means you invite the deity that is actually connected with the name to be present with you, within your mind. So, um, so from that perspective, we can 
we could say, yes, that's, that's transcendental. At the same time, we hear statements that claim if a person does not um, utter the sounds in a proper way, means also proper attitude, appreciation, or respect, these sounds are not transcendental. Same name, same syllables, different nature, apparently. And so we would need to ask the question, so what makes a transcendental sound transcendental? If all we can perceive is actually material sound. Now, how, how can I say, okay, that's transcendental sound, and it's not beyond this world, at the same time I can record it, I can sing it, I hear it, right? And there is a statement from Bhaktivinoda Thakur, one of our great Acharyas, who says, if a person has not the proper philosophical understanding, the proper attitude, the proper um, inner mood and appreciation for the names, these names become merely material syllables this person utters. So the significant factor is whether the sound is truly transcendental, is whether the person vibrating the sound is connected with transcendence. That is actually our philosophy. Because any person could say the name Krishna or Hare or Rama or speak a mantra from the Vedas, but it doesn't guarantee that the effect, the spiritual effect that is actually expected, will take place. That is because the chanter is the medium um, of the transcendental energy, and the mantra is, so to say, the vessel. But that doesn't mean that you can't just randomly just any any sounds. There, there, there are descriptions why these words are particularly vessels for for spiritual energy. But it's actually the transcendence is also what we call consciousness. In our in our body, we have we experience this body through consciousness. That's called the symptom of the soul, and the soul is by nature not material. That's what the Bhagavad Gita teaches. So also the consciousness is not a product of material energy, although it gets mixed up, so to speak, with material energy, identifies with that, and then we have something what we call material consciousness, which doesn't mean the consciousness became matter, but simply it became influenced, sometimes your proper uses infected by matter. And then the sound vibration that the person is vibrating is called material sound vibration. Although the consciousness is transcendental, the soul is transcendental, what comes out of the mouth is material sound. So actually the consciousness determines whether there's truly transcendental sound happening. Sri Prabhupada sometimes also says on one CD, when it's about the chanting, he says chanting from the lips of a non-devotee should be avoided as much as one should not drink milk that is touched by a poisonous snake. So quite a drastic metaphor. Um, he, he talks about those who maybe just make a business out of chanting, you know, make money. It's not about truly elevating oneself, truly serving the Lord. So even there, the same names suddenly became, become even poisonous, right? So the consciousness is like determined by the attitude, the thinking, the feeling, the willing of the chanter. And Krishna emphasizes, okay, the, the names should be chanted by those who are willing to become dedicated servants of the Lord, that the chanting itself becomes a service to Krishna and a service to others. Uh, and then, like the sound vibration, um, becomes what we call transcendental. Because if the, if the consciousness is affected by what we call the material modes of nature, then we have different grades. We all of us, everyone who is sitting here, we all have our specific level of consciousness right now. I cannot determine who, who, where is, who is where, and, but we just can assume everyone has this particular level of consciousness. And based on that, when we speak or chant, we are, let's say, more transcendental or less transcendental, depending 
you know, what is the purity or focus of our consciousness. And in the Vedic culture, we have a person called the Brahmana. Uh, Brahman is another word um, actually relating to what we call transcendence, spiritual energy. And the Brahmana is a person who is supposed to be situated in this sound. I find it, I find it a very beautiful phrase, being situated in sound, means he lives in the transcendental sound of the Vedas. He uses mantras, chants them, um, but in a, in a purity of consciousness. There's a lot of culture and philosophical, philosophical training and so on that shall facilitate that a person truly chants properly. And so that the mantra actually manifests its transcendental potency. So the mantra, we could also say, is potentially transcendental and reveals its transcendental potency if the chanter is qualified. You know, then these, these two, this is like a personal relationship. <laughs> it's not a mechanical um, process. We can just switch on, switch off. We can switch on, but if we are not, if the, if the name, since we say it's Krishna himself, if he does not sense the devotion or like the, the uh, how to say, the inclination of service and, and um, faith in Krishna, he can choose to stay away. He says, okay, you have the shell of the names you may chant and you enjoy the melody, you enjoy the instruments, maybe you enjoy the adoration of others who hear you singing, but I will not be present. Whereas it could be the opposite, like someone is very um, dedicated and in a deep mood of prayer, longing for Krishna. Then Krishna says, yes, I will be there. There's even the description, it says, someone who chants in the proper state of mind, with a pure heart, so to speak, Krishna says, he will start to dance on one's tongue. Try to imagine that, <laughs> Krishna, while, while the chanting is going on. So the name or the transcendental sound chooses to reveal itself according to the purity of consciousness, and then the person chanting becomes more and more spiritually powerful, so to speak. And the Brahmana that we mentioned it before, um, he's supposed to be spiritually potent, you know, and he should, through his chanting of hymns, of mantras, be able to elevate others. That's the, that's the duty. But first of all, of course, before one can elevate someone else, you must be elevated yourself. You cannot just think, oh, I would like to be a Brahmana, it sounds good to me, so let me do that. Well, it doesn't work that way. One has to be oneself um, elevated, do the work, so to speak. And there's a mantra that is being chanted um, for deity worship, and it starts with the syllable Om. Om is also one like very powerful transcendental sound, A-U-M. Right, and it, and it actually includes Radha, Krishna, the living entities, actually everything, so to speak, is included in the syllable Om. And it's also in the Bhagavad Gita described, usually all kinds of rituals and spiritual activities are being started with Om. Right, and then there's um, Om Tat Vishnu Paramam Param Sarapashanti Surayaha Diviva Chakshura Tatam Yati Prasipanyavo Chakravam Sasaminate Vishnu Yat Paramam Param. So this verse glorifies this Brahmana, saying, as a regular person can see the sun rays in the sky, we can see it today, you know, and we even need sunglasses because we can really not really look at them totally. In the same way, these wise and learned devotees, the Brahmins, they can always see the supreme abode of Lord Vishnu. So they can see, and it's called as darshan, um, the, the spiritual world. They have a transcendental vision. And I said, because of that, they can reveal that to others. So that's the ideal of a Brahmana, someone who is situated in transcendental sound, has access to transcendental realities and can, to the qualified um, inquiry, we must say, reveal transcendental knowledge, transcendental vision, the words of the Vedas, for example, themselves. It's not they are, they are, so to say, records of sound. 
Um, our tradition emphasizes we must hear, we shall listen, because the sound vibration that can enter our ear into our heart and have an effect on ourselves. The same sounds recorded in a book are also powerful if they're coming from an authorized source, as we would say, like Vedic scriptures. And if you read, you actually silently produce sound in your mind. Right? When you read to yourself, you hear your own voice. Therefore, it's also powerful to read these things aloud. <laughs> when you read to yourself loud, you have more even effect than you read silently. Um, and I said, still, it's an open secret like the Bhagavad Gita. Everyone can have the book. Everyone can read in it. Um, and it is transcendental knowledge, we say. And we said the transcendence is potentially there and can reveal itself to the sincere student who follows the process. Otherwise, it remains an, a closed secret. So, so many people commented on the Bhagavad Gita without grasping the essential spirit, or Acharya Shri Prabhupada used to point out. Because it's not a, um, a matter of scholarship or intellectual exercise, we have to become realized. So be yourself situated in transcendental sound. And um, because, as we said, all we can vibrate is material sound. With this, with this um, vocal cord, with this tongue, whatever comes out of my mouth is, first of all, a material sound. But it could be infused with transcendental energy if my consciousness is right. And then it mu doesn't have to be a mantra. Like any word I'm saying, if I really come from that connection, with Krishna, with transcendence, then my words are infused with transcendental potency and they have accordingly an effect. So therefore it's also said, we hear descriptions in the Srimad Bhagavatam and other places how people experience revelations through simple words from others. It's also said in the Sankhya philosophy, sound is that what gives us an idea of a thing. Idea means an inner image. Sound creates images in our mind. Even there's some technical descriptions. I'm really a layman on that, but I said in ether, there are also for the sounds, there are like subtle forms representing those sounds. And I think television and all this kind of stuff works based on this kind of thing. Sri Prabhupada mentions that in the purport also to the, in the Shima Bhagavatam. So the sound is very um, significant in order that we get an an imagination, an, an image of a given thing. So if the sound matches, so we can, must also say, okay, what kind of sound does actually um, relate to what type of object properly? You know, and also the, some powerful yogis, like the Sanskrit language is something different than, for example, German language or English. Each language has its capacities, but also limitations. And Sanskrit has like quite a few more capacities no, than, than other languages. And if one knows these subtleties and, and everything, then one can even through sound, for example, the yogis, they, it said by mantra, they can ignite a fire or manifest an element because there is a correspondence between the sound and the object the sound relates to. So similarly, we understand, okay, Krishna's name this is, is not different from Krishna, but it's even a transcendental sound. It's not a material relationship. So what we see, the, um, the connection between these two, sound and experience of a given thing, we talk about the person, Krishna. And the Vedas, there are, they are recorded sounds, but Sanskrit is still a material language, so to speak. <coughs> you know, we also vibrate with our material organs, sound. It's even claimed that uh, the, the demigods on higher planetary systems speak Sanskrit. So that's a very elevated language. And in the Sri Brahma Samhita, there's a purport where Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur explains how the Vedas in itself are not capable to reveal transcendence, which is confusing because we accept them for the very reason that we assume <laughs> they give us an understanding of transcendental knowledge. Right? They give us the insight. So he explains here, um, Brahma says that the transcendental absolute is beyond the reach of the Vedas. 
The Vedas originate in sound and sound originates in the mundane ether. So the Vedas cannot present before us a direct view of the transcendental world, Goloka, although they describe it. Right. So he goes on, it is only when the Vedas are imbued with the Zit potency that they are enabled to deal with the transcendental. So this is very significant. That's what we said before. Our language can be, so to say, empowered. Here it says imbued or infused with a certain potency that is called the Zit potency. Zit stands also for cognition. Bhaktisana Saraswati Thakur likes to use that word. Cognition means something like awareness that can be related to consciousness, thinking, having a grasp of something. So if this energy of the Lord enters the text or like enters our mind, so to speak, then the connection to the transcendental reality can happen. Otherwise it remains a material text and a material mind and still being disconnected from transcendence. Um, and he said, but Goloka reveals itself to every Jiva soul when he is under the influence of the spiritual cognitive potency joined to the essence of ecstatic energy. So this is um, a very crucial understanding in our philosophy that what we do is a practice of transcendental activities. Chanting is so-called transcendental, the transcendental knowledge in the books is there. But we always must understand transcendental means that only if we are in the proper state of mind, proper consciousness, that the transcendence enters us, empowers us, which means Krishna by his energy. And these are the vessels, so the Vedic scriptures, our real scriptures, which are particularly eligible for us to come to this proper state of consciousness, to come to the proper state of mind, so that when we chant, when we read philosophy, teach philosophy, when we worship, when we cook, when we talk, that then Krishna truly empowers that. You know, it has to do also with Shraddha, faith is one important thing. It's kind of a, an agreement of the soul to take this as true. Even if my mind thinks, really? No, that cannot be. Or like if I'm simply maybe not able even to grasp the statements, the philosophy sometimes is so abstract and complex, you think, uh, I don't really get it. You know, but to have this faith that even first of all you, it could be revealed to you, but to understand this is truth coming from a higher source. And I give it, so to say, in English you say, the benefit of the doubt, right? Um, but moving on to having even strong faith in those scriptures. So sound is very essential. Also on the material platform, um, sound is determining everything, practically. And we hear also in the scriptures, since we talked of the Brahma Samhita, we see here Brahma, uh, one, one image of him. He's the four-headed creator God within the universe, responsible for the secondary creation, meaning when the universe as an universal act, it's described, is prepared, then Vishnu takes his residence, and out of his navel, Brahma is being born on a lotus flower that stems from the navel. And also Brahma is being empowered by Krishna to create a world through sound. He said before, sound also is also giving an understanding of, of a thing, but also is the, how to say, the beginning of a thing. And it's described by Brahma himself. Um, there's a statement in the Hari Bhakti Vilas, where it is quoted from a scripture. Now I have it here in German, I need to translate it from, from there. Brahma is describing when he um, experienced again, or felt the desire to, um, to create, Krishna appeared again in his form as a coward boy. And he made the still to be created universe visible within the 18 syllable Gopal Mantra. So the Gopal Mantra is one of these um, so-called Gayatri mantras, which is considered um, to be um, uh, confidential. Right, it's not a mantra we chant like here, like with the harmonium. 
it's like more like it to be considered to be chanted in the mind. But here Brahma says, and based on that mantra, then he started to create. He said he created water from the syllable ka, um, from klim, which is in there. I will not also recite the full mantra because for the very reason we just said. Earth from the letter la, fire from the letter e, and the moon from bindu. So it's a particular syllable. Then the sun, we talked about before already, he also created from the word klim. Um, the sky was being created from the word krishnaya. Um, and from govindaya came air. And then the Surabi cows and so on. So then he, in this way he created everything within the universe based on that mantra. Because in the, in the sound, all the information is in that can manifest then within the material energy. Sound can also be very destructive. So it has both potencies. And we hear in the Srimad Bhagavatam of one personality called King Vena. He was very cruel. He was sadistic. Today we would probably call it a narcissistic psychopath, something like this. Um, he took pleasure in but since he was hunting also, he wounded the animals and enjoyed their suffering. He didn't wound them in a way that they die quickly. He just pur purposefully wounded them the way that they suffer for a long time. And then also by playing with his playmates, he used to drown them or suffocate them. It was just his pastime, so to speak. So he was very cruel. Um, and also as a king, he did many cruel things. So at some point, the brahmanas decided he must die. A bit late, one could argue, sometimes when you see how long King Vena uh, was able to go on with his um, atrocities. So, but they used a word to kill him. And in the um, Srimad Bhagavatam itself, in the um, fourth canto, 14th chapter, um, then the word hunkritai um, is being used, and it said through angry words, or sounds of whom. And this was said, even then it's more described, high-pitching sounds of whom. So I can't imitate that, so I don't know how this will really sound like. I imagine a bit something um, hysterical, angry sound, like whom, like which is really leading to the point that King Vena dies from sound, true sound, uttered by the Brahmanas again. Again, we have the Brahmins, you know, the, who can use the sound. So that's the other um, effect also mantra can have. Um, then we have King, King Vena's mother who was able, through mantra again, she preserved the body, preserve, uh, protected the body from decaying. And later even out of that body, um, uh, Shakti Avesha avatar of the Lord, King Pritu was being manifested. And they churned, they churned the, first the, the legs, then the arms. So it's a very interesting thing in itself, the pastime. So, but we stick with the sound. So therefore, and also in our spiritual life, we are wanted to be conscious or like be aware of two things. First of all, our state of consciousness, that we come from the right place, so to speak, that we try to purify our consciousness and that we use words consciously because they have power and that we are aware of the power words have. Right. Um, also, Rupa Goswami, in the beginning of the Upadeshamrita, is instructing everyone who is on this path to say, um, Vacho Vegam Manasakroda Vegam. Then he mentions a few more things, but Vacho Vegam means the urge to speak should be controlled. He uses the word Diraha, one should be able to tolerate the urge to speak, meaning sometimes it's good also to be silent, to not speak. Everything that comes to your mind, you know, out of various reasons, you know. So it's good to um, to be aware of what words can do, um, because then also in the Upadeshamrita there's one thing called um, prajalpa. That means when I just talk nonsense, Sri Prabhupada would say, <laughs> um, we refer to mundane talk, frivolous talk, gossip. Um, useless discussions of politics, 
and so on. So, because what happens, you can imagine, you, you, let's say you just had a gossip session with someone, or you argued about politics. So what's going on in your mind after that? During that already, it echoes. It stays with you. It influences you mentally, emotionally. Images are being created, feelings, and your body reacts also. So sound is powerful. As you, and you have an uplifting conversation, or like an, an uh, how to say, very um, educational session in, in, in some kind of training or whatever. Or like just a good talk with someone. You also can feel the effect of words and sounds. You know, also how someone speaks. Sometimes you get immediately annoyed when someone opens his or her mouth because you think, oh, I can't listen to that. You know, and sometimes you're really very pleased and feel like, wow, yes, I could, I could listen and go on. Yes, keep talking. So sounds like they have a lot in them that is even not so visible at the first place. We just know just something happens, you know, and and we feel the effect. So therefore, in in a spiritual life, one should be um, very selective. What to speak, when to speak, how to speak. And also Krishna addresses that in the Bhagavad Gita in the 17th chapter where he proposes a few um, types of renunciation in regards to speech. Austerities. Yes, austerities in regards to speech. Anudvega Racham Vakyam Satyam priya hitam chayat svadhyaya pyasanam chayva vanmaya tapa uchyate. He says, one should not speak in a way that agitates others. So, agitating, what could, agitating is interesting. Nowadays, people might be agitated by things where we don't mean anything, any harm or like any agitation. So, it has both sides, of course. But we should not... We should, if we see our speaking may agitate others, simply we should not speak. Shri Prabhupada gives the example that someone who is a teacher should not try to instruct those who are not willing to be his or her students, because they will just be agitated. You know, sometimes we say, "Don't preach to me," <laughs> right? Because yeah, that would be an example. Um, satyam, truthful. Uh, it's a challenging one to be transparent, to be genuine, to speak your mind. You know, might relate to unpleasant facts, might relate to your needs, um, might be to truthfully answer questions. So this is another thing that our words reflect reality. Words reflect consciousness. We can see that. You know, when we, the way we speak, the words we choose, the tone of voice. Um, also reflects and we can see where a person stands internally. You know, we reveal ourselves through sound. Your Prabhupada sometimes also says the most important quality of a person is speech. And he says, a fool remains undiscovered unless he or she speaks. When we open our mouth, we reveal ourselves. So out of that reason also it might be sometimes good to be a bit uh, give it a bit of time before you say something because <laughs> you, might, you might give something away that you don't want to give away. Um, yes, satyam, priya means pleasing, so that's also another challenging thing. Um, pleasing does, doesn't, doesn't relate to that you, how to say, be a so called people pleaser, always say what people want to hear. Pleasing means that it comes from a place of care, for example. You know, you're, you're a well-wisher, pleasing, you know, maybe you'd be able to phrase things in a way that they are digestible to people, but they're still containing truth, right? <laughs> How to say, sometimes we say the sugar-coated pill. Um, of course, this metaphor could also relate to you fail to say the truth, but um, something in this direction, uh, pleasing. Um, hitam, and this is something also very important, beneficial. So what would be beneficial for someone to hear? Um, also the Vedas are often full of, or like the scriptures we have, of constructive criticism. Sri Prabhupada doesn't, how to say, how do you say in English, kein, kein Blatt vom Mund nehmen. 
he doesn't hold back with, you know, he just blunt, sometimes really straightforward, just outspoken. outspoken. Yes, thank you. Very outspoken. Um, and for the benefit, though, of others, like, you might challenge certain illusions people have, or like, um, yeah, sometimes it's important to to express constructive criticism because some change is needed. So hitam is also important. And then svadhyaya, um, this relates to reciting Vedic literature that we had before, that we should engage in chanting the verses, the mantras, the hymns, of the Vedic scriptures, because this is beneficial for us, but also we should try to see the world through the eyes of Shastras. That this is our philosophy. We should not blindly accept it. We should um, take it in, also try to process it, understand it, and with faith accept it, and then also pass it on. And it's said when uh, Prabhupada gives the example in the purport to the verse 1715 that in spiritual circles, as soon as someone says something on a spiritual subject matter, particularly if he claims or she claims to make an authoritative statement, this person should be able to immediately relate to the particular source where it's coming from. You know, because you must say, where, where, where is it written? Where is it? Who says and why? And one should be able to quote the source. It's also common in academic circles. You not just, just post your opinion, you also relate to people that are, have certain credibility, certain authority perhaps, so that's also something that also has to do with um, speech, because sometimes, also in spiritual life, we express a lot of assumptions and speculations that might not be, not be really up to the facts, or not very accurate. You know, now there was also now there's Easter time, and sometimes also devotees feel tempted to um, give purports or explanations on Christ Christian theology and philosophy. Um, based on our philosophy, and sometimes it's a bit even embarrassing, I must say, when uh, when statements are being made that which have not don't really have basis necessarily, because simply I assume, oh yeah, I guess it's like that, and I make a statement, and then people who really have a clue about these things may think, what is this person talking about? You know, so one should be informed and be cautious to not be too certain about what one says without having really uh, checked one's understanding or fact. Yes, so this are, these are also helpful um, guidelines for um, coming to the point of controlling mind and in also in this way influencing our consciousness, because we said in the beginning, to round it up, um, that transcendental sound is actually material sound for us, infused with transcendental energy. If we are connected to the transcendence, if we are able to be a vessel, or like to be, um, how it said, uh, a medium even, yes, a medium, if we can be a tool for Krishna. As there it said, the text, the Vedas themselves, has to be have to be imbued by the cheat potency. So that's the idea that we uh, that we understand. Okay, transcendental sound is not how to say be taken for granted since I say the name Krishna, and I don't consider what is my state of mind or consciousness. Um, then I might be how to say um, selling myself short in my spiritual advancement. So I must be really careful to to cultivate a proper consciousness so that transcendence reveals itself in one's mind. And then one can also pass it on to others. So that's we what we accept um, also from Shri Prabhupada, from our Prampara, we take this knowledge, we take their sound vibrations. We are fortunate nowadays because we have recordings, right? We can hear like, I'm really grateful of if I can listen to Shri Prabhupada's classes, if I can only, only read, but have a vibration that I can connect to, or like the persons you know, that we feel, take inspiration from, that we take guidance from, that we can hear them. Yes, Hare Krishna. So we have still sufficient time if there are questions or comments or doubts. 
opposing opinions. <laughs> Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, you said that um, chanting by unqualified um, devotees could be poisoned. And my question is, um, what is then more important for this, for those who are on their way to qualified uh, devotees? Uh, would be it more important to listen to chanting or to chant? themselves. Um, do I understand you correctly? You are asking for those people who are considered to be the non-devotees whose chanting is poisonous. What would be best for them? No? Yes. Yes, you ask. Okay. Well, yes, what you pointed out, I would agree. Um, listen to sounds that come from someone who is truly a genuine devotee because then these sounds are uplifting and purifying. And, but one has to have some sincerity to even look for such a person, what, what to speak of finding such a person. Because we only find that, that what we want to find. <laughs> right? Hmm. Is that satisfying your question? This point, you said the Mahamantra, also the Vedas are pot potentially spiritual, transcendental. And last Saturday we had a whole talk that about what is spiritual, what is not spiritual, and that there are things that are inherently spiritual. And as you said, as we heard Prabhupada saying, when the people just touching the book, they emit and get even purified, they're making some progress. And we know when someone is chanting Hare Krishna in a chokingly way, they're also getting some benefit. Can you maybe some, say something about that? Yes. I mean, yeah, the subject matter certainly invites discussions because we have on both sides, we have statements. And I um, think both things can be at the same time true. Um, because if you consider that also the name of Krishna as a person can respond individually to, to people, right? So we can see both things are possible. One person can get a book and nothing happens, um, even reading it, and another person can just touch and have maybe some benefit. And Sri Prabhupada, in my understanding also to some degree, of course he wants to encourage faith and, and enthuse people, so by, by um, highlighting the, how powerful these books are. Um, at the same time, we see how many people have already touched books and have them for a long time be on their shelf. Right? Okay, we cannot understand when does a certain contact take effect. I don't know, that's up to Krishna. Um, or with the chanting, the so-called, um, uh, what's the Sanskrit word for the, um, un for the not, not conscious? Um, so, Agyata Sukriti. You know, even we do not consciously sing the name, but still, the name is merciful to the to the person and gives benefit. So I think it depends also on like, depending where we stand. If you're completely ignorant about stuff, have no clue, so I think Krishna is more generous and kind. But the more we take up the process and we even we make commitments like an initiation and so on, I think he expects more, and then he's not any more so. If freely given, you must be more. You must earn it a bit more, because at the end, also he says, Krishna doesn't is is not cheap. He doesn't give himself just to anyone like that, but he gives. Um, uh, how to say? Uh, yeah, little. Um, no, I don't have the word, but again, do you know what I mean? So I don't know. That's this would be some, yeah. Incentives. I think. Uh, so I don't know if Prabhu would also maybe comment on that. I don't know if there's. <laughs> um, no. Thank you, Prabhu. Um, I think you uh, navigated us through the uh, complexities and the nuances that exist in relationship to uh, how the transcendent entities of Shabda Brahma the spiritual sound and other things manifest 
within um, the material world. Um, there is a statement um, in the Vedas how sound actually has four different kind of categories of its presence. Um, <clears throat> on the grossest level, it's vak, which is just ordinary speech. Mm -hmm. And then Madhyama, which is within the mind, and Vaikari, which is the spiritual, um, the, the fourth. Um, but um, so everything that's in this material world ultimately is a reflection of spiritual existence. And therefore, Krishna's name present within this world is. Um, there's an interesting statement in the um, in the Bhagavatam which explains how that which is internal potency often appears in the material world as if it is the external potency. And of course, what is manifest in the material world is a reflection of the spiritual world. It, make, it almost looks like the spiritual world, but it is made of the modes. But at the same time, Krishna is arranging the opposite. He's arranging for spiritual aspects to manifest within this world, looking a bit like they're the ordinary material stuff. And in certain times, maybe even acting on us as the modes of nature do. But with the Harinam, you're quite right. The more we chant consciously, obviously the more we enter into the spirit of it, the more we're blessed by it the more we gain the benefit of it. But still we have this understanding that if people can just catch the holy name uttered by the lips of a devotee, because it's uttered by a devotee, it has that potency, as you were saying, and therefore anyone catching that in their ears is being benefited. Hence, we go out on Harinam. <laughs> Hence, we go out and chant on the streets. You know, I'm coming from the UK, and that's where we saw the devotees, you know, chanting up and down Oxford Street. That's how the Beatles saw the uh, devotees, just chanting up and down the street. What are they up to? You know, of course, it, it um, makes people inquisitive, but more than that, they're catching something about Krishna. They're something of the transcendence has entered into them. And it is, as you say, a gata sakriti, it is some kind of advancement that they have made. Some seed is placed in the heart, it's there. At some point, it grows, it manifests. So it's a very complex <laughs> picture. And you're absolutely right that for ourselves, we're not relying on that just simple mercy. We know something now about Krishna, so it is our duty to enter into the chanting of the Holy Name as purely and as sincerely, attentively, and as devotionally as we possibly can. And for the, us, that is how we want to advance within it. Thank you, Prabhu. Namaskar, Prabhu. So we, we talked about consciousness which is very difficult to to achieve and when we wa we are chanting we become mechanical and uh, you know, we, we start thinking about the meeting but still we are chanting so how to keep this consciousness alive mm -hmm. how to keep the consciousness alive <laughs> <laughs> yes well um, simply put one thing is carefully selecting selecting influences um, because there are many things that influence us every day that we are maybe not so aware of, that they are influencers, like whenever we take out our a smartphone or when we are even public transport, things we see, like uh, conversations we engage in. So this is one thing to try to filter a bit what kind of influences do I allow um, or what kind of habits do I still maintain. And just yesterday what I did is, I um, speaking of influencing myself, yeah, I walked the, in, in, in Switzerland, you have the national saint, Bruder Klaus. He's a uh, very, uh, how to say, a fine, impressive personality who practically lived a life of prayer. And also he actually, for 20 years or more, he lived without food, simply maintained by the love of God, so to speak. 
And there's a way called Bruder Klaus Weg, you know, it's kind of 20 kilometers or something, and it has little stations where you also can a bit absorb his life and, and, and how to say, activities. And it's, it's supposed to be, to bring you on the path of a true saint, so to speak, when you follow that. So that would be something, pilgrimage was always, and is also an interim tradition, a very powerful thing to maintain your consciousness like that, because you're aiming at, like, you use your body, your mind to attain um, in practically spiritual goals, you know, you enter maybe a temple, you take a darshan, or you hear about a saintly personality, so you absorb um, the good influence of others, <laughs> so to speak. So I felt, for me, this was um, also yesterday very nourishing, I like, so to find to find also, yeah, to be aware of, okay, where is my consciousness being nourished? It doesn't have to be the same for everyone, you know. Um, of course, essentially, you could say, yes, if I go to the kirtan and stay there and sing, what that, that. for others is, hey, if I have some time for myself, silence, and I can read the book in peace, then I absorb. Others feel, yeah, I'm on the altar, and if I can't do the things there and worship, then my... <laughs> so everyone can see where where one's consciousness is most nourished and it requires just a bit of self-reflection and then comes the consequence, right? The <laughs> discipline and to, to follow up on that. that. That's what I would say on that. All right. Thank you very much. Grant Raj.